Good morning, everyone. This is Paula from Advanced Queensland. I'm working with the Chief's Office on the Toolbox Talks. I'm going to introduce Aaron in a moment. Um, I hope you've been enjoying our sessions so far. Um, before we start, I'd like to firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, two, two things about today's session. Um, the chat is disabled. So if you would like to send Aaron a question, just use the Q&A function only. The other thing is the session will be recorded and we'll share that later on on social media. So feel, feel free to revisit that and share it as you like. Um, so I would like to now introduce Aaron Berkby from Peak Persona. Aaron's going to talk to us today about managing during times of change and ambiguity. So given the current circumstances, I'm sure this will be really valuable for a lot of people. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm just going to share my slides uh, at the moment when that comes up. Okay, awesome. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I really appreciate you giving up some of your time to uh, listen to me this morning. Um, can you guys, actually I'll just leave that there for the slide sharing. Um, but I hope you can all see the slides okay. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, managing yourself through times of ambiguity. So as was said, it's a very topical uh, time at the moment with change and ambiguity in, happening around us. Um, we're being disrupted by it. Um, as, as was mentioned, the session is being recorded, but please at any time just drop a uh, question into the Q&A box and I'll do my best to keep an eye on that window here on my screen to be able to answer them in real time. So please do interrupt at any point. Um, and more than happy to share the slides afterwards uh, with everyone as well so you don't have to frantically write down things off the slides. But my goal is to talk for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, um, then I'll, I'll happily dive into some Q&A. I'll, I'll talk fast because this is normally the content for a three month human accelerator program that we run. Um, and I'm trying to share as much actionable items as possible for all of you so that you get some tangible takeaways. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on who I am, but by background, I spent most of my life as a tech entrepreneur, uh, took two companies through both GFC events, uh, taken four companies to exit. I've invested in nine companies, but more recently, um, up in the last seven years, been playing around the startup ecosystem. And through that time, I've had the luxury of working with thousands of entrepreneurs and investors. And I've been able to witness and learn from them and also through missions to places like Silicon Valley, London, Berlin and Israel. And so now I actually have the luxury of working as a uh, human transformation architect, which is an interesting way of describing helping humans and teams through periods of change, disruption, um, to upskill them to better deal with ambiguity, to not just survive those times, but to actually thrive in it. And really what we're about is building leaders who actually recognize the value of creating change rather than being always disrupted by it. So I'm gonna be sharing those techniques that have been learned from that experience. Um, I'm also the co-founder of Peak Persona, which is a program we've been running for three years now. It's a human accelerator program. It basically takes individuals, predominantly entrepreneurs and founders, uh, through eight modules that include adulting, how do we basically look after ourselves, a toolkit for psychological intervention, how do we shift our mindset and our thinking, um, also decision making. One of the funny things about decision making is that we're, not, we're never actually taught how to make decisions. Uh, so we share decision making frameworks, we share time management tools, leadership tools, but also something we call role and soul profiling, which is understanding yourself, your soul, uh, and then mapping yourself into the ideal role. Uh, we've had over 300 alumni go through that program. I'll be sharing some of the techniques that they've shared as well during the session uh, this morning. I don't think we need to dwell on why this session is important right now, but I, I guess just for context, the, the, the key things that are happening in the world, we're seeing a lot of change. We're seeing a lot of disruption to the ways we not just do business and go about our jobs, but also social constructs have significantly changed with isolation. And so we have this unique situation right now where we're all being called upon to not just work in new ways, but to actually live, socialize, have relationships, manage our children and our families and all these competing obligations in entirely new ways that we haven't done before. And any time that there's ambiguity, there's a lack of information, there's a lack of certainty, um, humans really struggle with that. So uh, we're just not naturally talented at it. Um, there's a comment there, just if we could mute the other microphone. Um, Paul, I'm not sure if you could maybe just mute yours. I think they might be getting some feedback. Um, through the system. 
Um, but the, the thing is, yes, as much as we're all dealing with change, in reality, there's a lot of people who are very good at managing ambiguity and change. Uh, and I think in this category, we look at um, people in combat situations, so military personnel who are in battlefields walking into villages or having to clear buildings and houses where there's a lack of intelligence, there's a lack of information, that every day they step foot into ambiguity. Um, police officers as well, so I've had the, the luxury of um, some family members, including one in particular who was number one uh, TRG, meaning basically the New South Wales SWAT team, he was number one, the first through the door. And the way he would talk about how do you actually prepare to walk into an environment, a high risk situation, not knowing what's on the other side of the door. Um, also astronauts, so uh, NASA has a statistic that every mission plan has an average time of about 15 minutes post launch before that mission plan deviates. Um, because they're constantly having to deal with ambiguity, uncertainty over positions of other things in space or asteroids or anything else, but also the potential risk of equipment failure. And then, of course, entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs deal with ambiguity every single day. Um, we are constantly called upon to do new things, particularly startup founders. We, we're called upon to wear so many different hats, to do new things, um, to respond to changing markets, changing demands of customers, not even knowing who our customers are, changing teams. So I think... The beauty of this for all of us is there's so many lessons here that we can learn from, from those who have to deal with ambiguity every single day. And really when you distill it down, there's one thing that stands out and that is they train for ambiguity. They, they train for it. And I've got this little quote here that the Navy SEALs uh, use, but you know, we, we had the luxury of interviewing Ben Robert Smith, who's one of the Victoria Cross recipients here in Australia. Uh, he received the accolade or the, the award for um, basically saving his platoon when they were under fire. And he talks about storming into a building and literally at the moment when he walked into the building and he's facing enemy combatants, his gun actually misfired and he had no way of protecting himself. But in that moment, he defaulted to his training. He knew the response was counter to the human reaction. Most humans will want to flight, run away, he had to keep moving forward towards the enemy knowing he couldn't protect himself. And that was because of the training. You default to your training. It was also because he knew that the team behind him would back him up. They would walk through the door next and that's ultimately what happened. But we can use these stories and analogies to actually equip ourselves. And fundamentally, the best way to deal with change and ambiguity is to understand the one constant that we have in every situation. There's one thing that is universally consistent with every um, changing situation or whenever we're dealing with ambiguity, and that is ourselves. And we need to develop and invest in ourselves so that we can uh, basically rely on ourselves in those moments. We need to have the ability to know that we are going to walk through the door behind ourselves when we are stuck in that situation of not being able to protect ourselves. We need to know that we can rely on ourselves to do the hard things at the times when we don't want to do them. So how are we going to do that? Well, it turns out uh, through our studies of high achievers, whether they are athletes, whether they're the categories we just talked about, whether they are entrepreneurs, there's a common four key ingredients that successful individuals have. And they start with mindset. There's a definite common mindset with those that are um, able to deal with ambiguity and change, but also are high growth humans. Then there's the rituals or the habits and routines. They have a toolkit. These are techniques that they actively use to transition between states of mind. And finally, they have a tribe. In other words, those people around them to support them, um, to enable them and to empower them. And what I'm going to do now is just go through each of those. Starting with the mindset. Now, uh, there was a little quote recently, Simon Sinek, who talks a lot about leadership and purpose. Uh, he did a little team call recently. And one of the things he said during the call, he was talking to his team about how they are going to navigate uh, the change in the world. And he described it this way, we need to be thinking about the opportunity. We need to be thinking about what can we be as a result of this, as opposed to being focused on trying to preserve what we had. Because the reality is we're entering a new world. Um, if this uh, phase of social isolation and distancing and economic impact continues for an extended period, what we will see are new habits being formed. Uh, because the reality is it takes 66 days to form a new habit and very much more than likely we will be in this mode of operation for much longer than that. So people working remotely, using Zoom, um, using different new techniques to engage socially will become the new normal. We are entering a new world. And the point here is we need to accept this. 
once we accept it, we can stop focusing on how do we keep what we had and instead look at how do we become what we need to be. Now there's one um, key indicator of success. So if you look at the studies across um, individuals, whether they are entrepreneurs, whatever field of endeavor they're in, whatever they set about themselves to do, and regardless of the circumstances in which they're facing, there's one common ingredient that you can measure, which would basically predetermine or give you an indicator of whether that person will be successful in what they're trying to do. And it's actually grit. So Angela Duckworth um, has done a number of studies in this area. She's written a book on this topic, but the number one indicator of surviving anything is grit. Now the problem with grit is it's often misinterpreted as your ability to suffer pain, um, but that's actually not true. So now the way this can manifest is if you put a group of entrepreneurs on a treadmill and tell them to run on an incline five minutes beyond the point at which they normally give up, those that actually run that additional five minutes, regardless of their fitness, regardless of how much they've exercised previously, if they push through beyond their normal threshold, they're more likely to be successful as an entrepreneur, which can sound sort of challenging and confronting. But grit isn't just about our ability to suffer through pain. It, it's, it actually comes down to our ability to be disciplined, to do the things that we don't want to do when they have to be done. And part of this comes back to a, a growth versus fix mindset. Um, now, a growth mindset basically has the belief that I can, whereas a fixed mindset believes I am. So if I asked a group of you right now, um, you know, are you musical? Can you play a guitar? Um, I, are you musically talented? There'd be a big chunk of you that says, no, I'm just, I don't have a musical bone in my body, I'm not. Whereas a growth mindset, you know, when asked the question, can you play the guitar, they would say, yes, I can, I just don't know how to yet. And that might sound a bit bizarre, but we, once you pick up on the language nuances of someone who says, I can, and I will, and I have, it's a very different approach to looking at the world as opposed to this fixed mindset of I'm limited by external beliefs because a fixed mindset will look at circumstance and blame the circumstance for why they can't move forward. A growth mindset will ask the question, well, how might we move forward? And the how might we exercise is a really powerful tool. And um, there's a question here as well, just uh, how do you sign up for Peak Persona support beyond the webinar? I'll share some links at the end and more than happy to share those details. Now, one mechanism of, of growing our mindset and developing a growth mindset is to identify our triggers. So a trigger is any time you have an, an overreaction, an, an emotional reaction to an event that doesn't really make sense for what it was. And this requires a lot of self-reflection. So one of the things we get participants in our programs to do is I just grab their iPhone or their Android, whatever, but record a video of themselves talking to their phone for at least three minutes at the end of every day. And this isn't like, what did you do today? It's how did you feel today? What did you learn about yourself? If you're triggered by something, you have an angry reaction, why did you have that reaction to that? And diving deep on it to really understand it. Um, but reflection is a really powerful tool to unlocking inhibiting beliefs. There's a lot more I could talk about mindset, but in the interest of getting as much value across to all of you as possible, I'd like to now touch on rituals, which was the second ingredient we mentioned. And um, I have to apologize. I'm not sure why the icons have all duplicated the way they have, but we teach a number of programs, uh, sorry, a number of, um, rituals that are used by high achievers. I'm just going to focus on three or four for this one to keep it brief, but making your bed. Now this can sound really bizarre. It's like, seriously, Aaron, you're telling me to make my bed. Um, but making your bed every single day, there's a reason why hardened Marines are made to do this, why special forces soldiers are made to do this every single day. And yes, it's about discipline, but it's about self-discipline. It's also about setting yourself up into a state of momentum. So starting your day, having ticked something off, having achieved something puts you in a state of momentum where the studies show you're more likely to then achieve the next thing. Plus, every time you walk into your room and see your bed made, it puts you into a positive state, state of mind. So even without realizing it psychologically, your body actually has a physiological reaction. You actually have endorphins released. You're actually more likely to feel positive. And we've had over 300 alumni that we forced to make their beds every morning, and it has this ripple effect across the rest of their house. They become more organized. But also, if you have a crap day, you've got a nice, comfortable bed to get in. And um, the next one here is exercise. So when we think of exercise, we often default to thinking of the physical benefit. The reality is there's actually a massive psychological benefit. So study after study has shown that um, exercise improves your mental well-being, um, your mental resilience and toughness. And going back to the key point of this, our ability to deal with change and ambiguity is our ability to rely on ourselves. So if we are the, the type of human 
that we know gets up and exercises every single morning, regardless of whether it is dark, whether it is raining, whether it is cold or whatever, then we know that when we walk into the battlefield of change and ambiguity, we can rely on ourselves to do the hard things, to make the right decisions, to be more present in the moment rather than emotionally reacting to it. And this is why daily exercise is really critical. Another one I've highlighted on this slide is spaces and zones. Now this is about compartmentalization, so physical compartmentalization. How do you create physical boundaries in your workspace, um, in your home, to separate work uh, from home life or from social life or from family time? And it's kind of a broader thing, a concept of compartmentalization of thoughts. So high achievers and those that are very talented at dealing with change and ambiguity and removing fear are very good at compartmentalizing emotions from their um, activity, from where they need to be thinking and doing their critical thinking. And spaces and zones and being, having effective boundaries over your physical spaces and your use of time is one effective way to develop that skill set. Um, just a quick one on here too that I'll shout out for, but um, waking early. So actually, most, of, most people wake up and it's in response to the world. So they wake up and immediately they're having to react to the needs of their kids, their partner, work or something else. We actually prescribe um, that you should wake up an hour earlier than normal. So 75% of the world's top CEOs, for example, wake up before 5 a.m. And that's not to do more work. Uh, it's actually to invest time in themselves, use it for exercise, meditation, reading, yoga, just some alone time to process your thoughts. If you suffer um, from um, a sense of agitation, that there's too much noise around you, that you're getting triggered by noisy environments, it's a sign that you don't have inner peace. Your brain is too occupied and you need a moment um, in your day where you actually clear all those thoughts and bring your brain back to inbox zero. There's a lot more habits and routines that are there. Um, and again, this is just a small fraction of the total, but they're probably the key ones for changing ambiguity. Next, just looking at a toolkit. And again, we have a lot of techniques in our toolkit that we teach. Uh, for, for basically, when we talk about a toolkit, these are ways of transitioning between modes of action. So if you have to end your workday and you've been you know, the Top Gun CEO and then you come back into a mode of being a dad or a mum, you can't just use that same persona. You can't use that same mode of action. You have to transition into a different psychology, a different mindset. And so we have a range of techniques to do this from music to using third spaces, even a virtual commute, like walking out of your door, around the block, coming back in, getting changed out of your work clothes from the day, having a shower to wash the day off you and putting on something more relaxed, for example. But again, I've highlighted a couple of key techniques here in the interest of time. Um, number one is to use something called a parking lot. So a parking lot is when you literally have a conversation or some, an idea pops in your head, but it's off the current topic and you need to park it for later. So you could do this with a little whiteboard, a notepad, post-it notes on your wall. But what it allows you to do is maintain focus. It allows you to stay focused on the mission, what you need to achieve right now, and park those other things for later. And then you need to schedule time uh, for you to be able to basically review those tasks. There's also here unplug and digital detox. So this is a key one, particularly right now. I think many of us are consuming a lot of news. We're reading a lot of content. There's never been more content produced in the world per minute than right now. So you're bombarded with information, which information flow is critical during periods of ambiguity because the more information reduces ambiguity. But the problem is we need to unplug. We need moments to process. All the information that's flying into our heads, we need that time to actually process that information. So unplug means literally putting your devices away, lock them in a drawer, hide them in a cupboard, do not look at them, do not consume news for an extended period of time, like a couple of hours. So doing it for at least one hour a day, particularly when you're around loved ones so you can be fully present with them, but also for an extended period each week and each year, even going on at least a three to four day unplug where you completely disconnect from the world. There's also here, I've mentioned decision-making framework, but how do you separate emotions from decisions? So during periods like this, many of us have our income massively impacted. We have other issues massively impacted. How do um, our families are massively impacted, the health of loved ones? How do we separate emotions from making good quality decisions? And we need to be able to compartmentalize. So there's, invest some time in researching decision-making frameworks, but I'll give you a quick one in the interest of time. And that is, to think about your future self. What would the future best version of me do in this moment? Or to use something we call the virtual boardroom, where in your head you have a, a virtual room of advisors of certain people. So for example, you might choose Elon Musk or Oprah Winfrey or uh, Michelle Obama. And you ask yourself, what would they do in my situation? And it's cognitive dissonance. It's separating 
yourself from the current circumstance so that you can make a better quality decision. The last one on this screen here is called Downloads. Downloads is basically just where you, um, for example, you pick up the phone, call a colleague or, or a best friend and say, can I just download to you? I, it's basically like a rant. It's, it's a bit of a purge, but it's to get something emotional out or something from your day, just to talk about your day. And what it does is it gives you a sense of release. As soon as you verbalize it, it's gone out of the system into the ether. They don't need to problem solve. They don't need to um, help you. They just purely need to practice um, empathetic listening. Again, these are just some of the techniques. There's, there's a ton more we could talk about. More than happy to share offline afterwards. The last ingredient of the four is, is tribe. And this is about building your support crew around you. So when you think of the back to the military example or a Formula One team or an astronaut, sending an astronaut into space, like we think of the first Mercury 7 astronauts and the complete uncertainty that they had being the first humans to ever enter space and what that must have felt like but they had an entire mission control behind them supporting them. So what we mean here is you need to build your support crews. You need to invest in your human relationships with your family and social groups, with your peer groups. So for example, right now, while you're in isolation, scheduling time every day to have a water cooler conversation with your team, with your work team. So you just all jump on Zoom. There's no set agenda. It's just banter. Just have absolute banter time. Um, with my social groups, I'm having Zoom calls on the weekend. We have a, we're playing a board game together via Zoom. And this isn't just for you, it's also for your kids. So how do you, while your kids are home from school, how do you ensure they have social time? So arranging group Zoom calls for kids to basically catch up and chat and maintain those social development skills is really important. And two on here that I'll definitely mention, one is having good quality mentors and also coaches. Um, coaches are really critical. They'll, they'll, they'll be in your corner and they'll back you and support you. But mentors and coaches basically give that third party perspective so they can help remove the emotion from decision making. And ideally you find someone that, you know, they've been through the path before you so they can talk from a place of experience. They're the four key elements. Um, I appreciate we have about seven and a half minutes left. So I'm just going to share, there's some books here again, that you'll have access to the, to the slides, but basically consume anything by Brene Brown. Um, she talks a lot about the power of vulnerability and how courageous it is to be vulnerable. It's a lot of, those soft emotional intelligence schools, uh, skills. Um, a bit extreme the other way is David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me, which is much more about building calluses, but uh, he went through the Navy SEALs um, Hell Week, the, the training program, three times. He's an ultra marathon runner, um, a crazy individual, but he has some great mindset techniques. Tool for Titans, uh, this is where Tim Ferriss, who you'd know from the four hour work week, has interviewed thousands of successful people and distilled their key habits and techniques into a book. It's difficult to read. We, we've converted a lot of this into a, a program instead to make it easier. But definitely any content around building effective habits. And heaps of podcasts. So these are just three, but uh, particularly the Tough Girl podcast. Th these are women around the world who've done amazing world record setting adventures and they share their experience of doing that. Um, often many cases never stepped foot on a bike before, for example, and then ridden you know, thousands of kilometers. Um, but great podcast content is coming out around the world. Uh, we also have a community of high growth humans and the links there, if you do want to join that, um, it's basically just a Slack community. We also have a program so that the question before someone asked about signing up for Peak Persona. Uh, so we have a 14 day shift program. So as well as our three month human accelerator program, uh, we have these shorter programs. I definitely recommend the adulting one. So getting your core fundamentals of self care and also the toolkit for psychological intervention. They're the first two modules. Just jump on peakpersona.com. They're, like we've dropped the price massively during this period, but if anyone is struggling where they can't pay uh, the $120 for the 14 day program, like please just hit me up. I'm more than happy to help you out. And we also have some psychometric profiling workshops coming up again. I'll just leave the slide in the content for those interested. Don't really want to dwell on it. More importantly, I'd love to hear any of your questions. So um, please ask away in the Q and A panel. If there's anything I can help with, um, Yes, I see grit in my kids when they never give up in a board game. Yes, yeah, so this is really fascinating. And Angela Duckworth in her book does talk about techniques for building grit in your children. And just one thing I'll quickly share is whenever they decide to do something, they, um, you have to basically force them to see it through to completion. So, for example, if they sign up for tennis lessons for a school term, they have to commit to going every single week, regardless of rain, hail or shine, they go to the tennis lesson, even if they don't want to. Because, again, you're building up the... The, their ability to do things they don't want to do consistently. Um, but it's great, Craig, that you see that in your kids. That, that, that's fantastic from an early age. 
Aaron, will you be sharing this on your own social media as well? Like we'll share it on the Chief's social media afterwards. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll upload a recording of, of this live session uh, to YouTube and I'm more than happy to share that out. I'll, in the YouTube description, I'll include the um, link to the slide deck as well so that, you know, because I went through it extremely fast, you'll be able to grab those as well. Um, I will link it through. There's a question there, um, the sign-up pages on your site. Uh, just jump on, so if you jump on peakpersona.com, um, click on the link for programs and there'll be a link there for the 14-day program. The webinar ones I'll share in the, um, the content in the slide deck so you've got access to all those links. And I should actually put them up on a website. That's a good point. <laughs> Thanks, Hamilton. Um, any other questions? I'm more than happy to talk about anything that might have been triggered as a thought there. Or Also, if any of you have anything you want to share as your own techniques, I'm more than happy to read them out for everyone else to read as well. Uh, yeah, so, so Craig just mentioned a point about uh, the other work that we do. So we do do a lot of uh, coaching, uh, as in executive coaching. We also, through Tribe Global, we work with team leaders. So basically, we've developed a modern uh, leadership toolkit of techniques taken from the highest growth companies in the world. And we teach leaders new techniques. So for those of you who are managing teams, um, there's a whole new framework for leadership in, in times like this. And it really involves giving your teams more autonomy and incentivizing the behavior you want, not the outcome you want, which can sound counterintuitive, but the studies show that if you incentivize the outcome, it, that model only works for things like production lines. So it's great for Henry Ford where they're just building widgets on cars, incentivize outcomes, that's fantastic. But if you're dealing with change and ambiguity and it requires innovative thinking, then you have to incentivize behavior, not outcomes because it's gonna require people to fail and make mistakes. Um, so I've seen a lot of questions about how do we track the time that our staff are putting in when they're working remotely? It's the wrong question. It's not about uh, time tracking, it's about accountability to the rest of the team. The reason why a special forces unit um, like Ben Robert Smith, when he stormed that house and had to take that position or they were gonna die, the reason that worked was peer-to-peer -peer accountability. They had to know that each other had each other's back and were willing to give up their lives for one another. And that's what you need to build within your team. You need bossless teams. The boss becomes a coach, not a, a dictator. Meetings should happen irrespective of whether the boss can make it to the meeting or not. Everyone should be accountable to reporting to their peers, not high performers reporting to one individual. There's an entire session uh, we could do on, on just that alone as well. But it's a great question, Craig, about yeah, building accountability within particularly within remote teams. Um, it requires a step change of leadership. Uh, just scrolling down, Hamilton, what about curbing chaos that creeps up in a business due to external events? Yeah, so one thing is, I mean, we, we can't control external chaos. Uh, what we actually have to do is look at how do we leverage it. Um, so one, there's a few techniques and that comes down to, and I'm sorry if you can hear my kids in the background, they're downstairs going a bit stir crazy. But um, part of it is about building a culture. So the culture within the team needs to be able to accept failure and needs to understand that failure is actually an opportunity for growth. So when we talk about chaos, often it's the fear that think that it's the fear of the unknown. It's the lack of information, but also it's, it's the prospect that we're going to fail and get things wrong. And high growth companies, um, they actually deliberately focus on getting things wrong. So for example, um, every team with inside Facebook has to run 10 experiments a week. And that is experiments on the feed, how information is presented but they actually have a metric. They have to fail on 70% of them. And that's not failing because they suck at execution. That's failing because they should be pushing the paradigm of what is known. In other words, they're creating change rather than waiting for change to happen to them. So there's a lot of techniques like that. There's, there's probably close to hundred techniques specifically to instill that. And it's a really good question because right now I think a lot of businesses are feeling exactly what you've described Hamilton. And, and it's a, it's a tough one to, um, distilled down into a short answer now. But look at what companies like Atlassian do. Um, Google Atlassian, I can't remember the guy's name, but the Dominic, Dominic at Atlassian, some of the work he does to, to answer that. It, it's great work. Uh, just scrolling down the Q&A. Yeah, how do we deal with things like screen, <coughs> sorry, screen and um, Zoom fatigue being the new normal? Yeah, so we have to unplug, we have to take breaks away. We have to do more physical, the physical movements down. So you, 
I'm exercising morning and night now um, to get the physical exercise back up. Um, switching to a standing desk at different points during the day. The other thing is not everything has to be done by Zoom. Um, right now, everyone seems to have defaulted to, oh, let's all have these face-to-face -face meetings, which is great for more information flow and comms to reduce ambiguity. But I think we need to also recognise that some things can just be done on an SMS or an email. Um, so actually going for short form might actually be one way around it. Um, the other thing is not being afraid to say no. So, you know, sometimes we just are in overwhelm and overload. And we need to actually honour that and respect that and give ourselves permission to manage our personal well-being. I think more than ever, that's really critical. So it's about knowing what you need and, and prioritising that as well. Uh, what is an unconference? Um, great question, Craig. So an unconference is basically, think of a conference, but it's where it's unscheduled. So I'm working with a lot of teams at the moment which are looking at how do they foster interpersonal relationships in their teams or in their customer base or in their communities. So an unconference is where basically you could set up a Zoom, invite a whole heap of people to it, and people just suggest topics. And even if it's a work team, these aren't necessarily work topics. They might be, but someone might just want to say, hey, I want to talk about knots for sailing, knots on yachts for sailing. And someone else wants to talk about alternative endings for Game of Thrones and someone else wants to talk about a specific problem they have at work and then people form groups around those topics and they go into little breakout rooms within Zoom and just chat. Now the reason this works and I know I'm over time but I want to share this, the reason it works is that in Israel, Israel has one of the highest rates of innovation in the world. It's a small population of 8 million people um, but they have the, something like 8,000 high growth, high tech companies. And we've been there on multiple missions. And, and what makes it work, the feedback is the mandatory military service, which immediately think, well, how the hell does that relate to an unconference? The thing about a mandatory military service is it forces people from different socio-demographic backgrounds to intermix with one another. And they become best friends by virtue of having to work together. And what that means is two people who would never otherwise cross paths in life are suddenly deployed into a battle unit together and become best friends. And they build up this interpersonal relationship on a common bond. That's what an unconference can do. So an unconference allows people within your organisation or within your customer base to come together and share something in common that they are passionate about. Build a relationship on something that's not a work context. And it builds these relationships where then Mary from the mailroom is suddenly connected to John in development, who's suddenly connected to Jane in IT security through a common bond. And so you have a more connected tribe. So ultimately, all of this is about how do you build tribes? Tribes are very good at recognising when there's an attack on one member of the tribe, it's an attack on the entire tribe. And they go into war for one another because they have peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So an unconference is just one of the hundred techniques of how to actually build that within your organisation or within your customer base. And we're awesome. coming towards the end of the session. Is there any other burning questions? Uh, we might have to wrap up fairly soon. Yeah, thanks for those of you who did ask questions. They were really good. Craig, they were great questions. Hamilton, thanks very much. Good questions. Um, yeah, please, look, I do, actually, I do have a contact slide here. If, if I can help in any way, please do reach out at any time. Um, if you want help with your teams, with your leadership management, uh, with the programs, if there's anything I've missed, if there's anything you have to add as well, I always love learning new things that people are doing, so please share that with me. And any feedback, always love to hear that as well. But I really appreciate you all giving up your time this morning to tune in. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we've really appreciated it. I'm sure you've got a virtual round of applause going on right now. And uh, as we said, we will share everything and we really appre appreciate your input and your advice. Thank you so much. Have a good Easter, everyone. Take care and um, just keep following the Chiefs page. We've got plenty of more um, amazing speakers coming up in the future. Thanks so much. Cheers. Thanks.